one of the similes that are used for meditation is that of sitting like a mountain. And uh, the mountain, I think, is supposed to represent stability and uprightness and, and, um, and kind of being unmovable by all the winds of the world and all the challenges that come along and just be able to sit there. And the mountain has this very wide, stable base and so it's at rest, at peace, and the storms of life can go around it and the mountain just stays. And so meditation, we sit this way. So um, <clears throat> to kind of work with that metaphor or simile, um, I'm thinking that uh, sometimes our mountains are enshrouded in the clouds, covered in fog. And uh, we don't even know there is a mountain. Uh, from a distance, you know, you look up at some mountain far in the distance and it's, it's all fogged in, clouded in, and no one, you know, if you've never been to that area, you don't even know there's a mountain there. So some of us are so much, there are times when we're in the fog, uh, you know, mental fog, and uh, we don't even, not only don't we know that there's a mountain available to us, but we don't even know that who we are or what's going on, and everything's vague and fog and shrouded. And, um, and so <clears throat> the process of practice or meditation, especially, <clears throat> is to uh, uh, support the possibility of the fog and the clouds to settle and, and dissipate. So not only can we see clearly, but we can see the whole mountain. And if we see the whole mountain, then it's easier to be stable and full and kind of inhabit who we are in a full way. <clears throat> become whole, perhaps. And uh, <clears throat> so if we're lucky, um, j- just enough of the f- clouds part or the fog settles, and so the top of the mountain is exposed. I used to live up here in the, in the mountains above here on Skyline, and there were times when it was all sopped in with fog. And, but sometimes the fog and clouds would clear, and we'd be above the cl- uh, and we look down into the into Silicon Valley here, and it would be covered in in uh, fog. But we were up in the sun and blue skies. It was quite a something. So sometimes uh, the clouds clear just enough that we get some sense of here I am, and this is something. And and um, and uh, in my little analogy, I think the top of the mountain is kind of our thinking world, the world we have thoughts and stories, ideas about what's going on. And our thoughts are important parts of our lives, but they also can uh, ruin our lives. They can also uh, create tremendous amount of problems for us and stress for us and preoccupation in us. And, and, um, and sometimes those thoughts are the very fog that covers the mountain, but they dissipate enough and we can see them more clearly a little bit. And we can identify very strongly with them. And sometimes the thinking world is we believe we are our thoughts, or thoughts and me are the same. So whatever I think is very important and crucial. And, um, <coughs> and, um, and the emphasis and the importance we can give to this thinking world of ours uh, is kind of like taking the mountain and putting it upside down so it's resting on the tip of the mountain in which case it becomes very unstable. And uh, if we're kind of too much swirling around in the world of our thoughts, there's a kind of instability that's there unless we are totally swirling. (laughs) And then we're in this, you know, stable mountain of delusion, of fog. (laughs) So, um, So what do we do when we start getting a sense there is a mountain, there's more here. There's something beyond this world of thoughts and preoccupations and concerns that I have. What do we do? And, um, and there's a lot of things to be said about this, but uh, one of the core things about meditation is you don't do much. Uh, and so I like the idea of stopping. We just stop. And if we stop skillfully in a wise way, the clouds will settle and the fogs will dissipate slowly, bit by bit. And as it does so, more and more of the mountain becomes exposed until the whole mountain is here. So uh, how do we 
stop. So if we take this word stop and use it as an acronym, then I'd like to suggest that uh, four steps. There's a seeing, to see, and then there's tasting, and then there's opening, and then there's uh, being at peace with what's there. So uh, seeing is the heart of vipassana, and so we want to recognize what's happening. We want to recognize what's happening. And uh, this rec- the, act- a- 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 the, the aspect of seeing is a very powerful because when we can see with our eyes something out there in the world, in the seeing itself, we're not interfering with anything. We're not like, you know, if, if I see any of you sitting here where I am, uh, I'm not in you, I'm not touching you, I'm not, you know, you know, there's a, I'm here and you're there. And the seeing itself is a kind of a clear channel. Now, I might have all kinds of, you know, shenanigans, shenanigans in my mind based on what I see, but the seeing is just the seeing. So to learn how to see, to recognize, and the recognition is actually a very important part of the seeing, where we uh, clearly acknowledge what we're seeing a clear recognition. And partly this recognition is, in our tradition, is done by mental noting, a label. It doesn't have to be that way, but it represents like this. Um, Because when we uh, use a note, a mental label, what we're seeing, and we do it emphatically enough or clear enough or um, um, honest enough so that really recognize it's there. So what what I'm trying to say is, if we just see through our eyes, I might see all kinds of things. And, uh, but, uh, uh, it's so easy to be involved with what I see, to be thinking about it, to be pulled into it, and to somehow be in in active relationship to it, to identify with it, have aversion to it, all kinds of things. But the function of mental noting is to be able to step away from what we see and observe it independently. So, uh, you know, if I go outside today and there's a blue sky and I kind of see the blue sky, I know it's a blue sky and I'm walking and, and I kind of think, well, this is great, blue sky is good, I'll get a 10, that'll be great, people will like me much more. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, you know, we should do more of this and, you know, and I recognize that the sky is blue, but I'm kind of in the sky, in the thoughts of it and all that. But I, if I go outside and see that the sky is blue, and I tell myself, the sky is blue. Wow. The sky is blue. But that kind of clear recognition, that's very different than, oh yeah, the sky is blue, oh, is this so nice, and I like blue, and... Oh yes, the sky is blue, ah. Can you you see the difference? So it might seem kind of cold, clinical, removed to say, oh, the sky is blue. It's a blue sky, blue. But that's uh, not meant to be that way. It's meant to kind of free us from the entanglement that we have. The stories, the preferences, all the things that we get involved. And so part of the function of mental noting is to step back far enough so that we can see, um, see, just see, and not be caught up in what's there. So no matter what it is in here, and there's all kinds of things that would come up as we are opening up to see. And what we're trying to learn is not only to see what's there, we're also learning to see in a new way. And this is a very important idea. We're not only trying to see what's there, understand what's going on, but we're trying to understand it or see it in this clear, independent way. Wow, look at that. You can still have your preferences and like it and not like it and all those things, uh, but that's a different part of the mind. It's a different activity that you also want to recognize clearly. Wow, there's a preference for a blue sky. That's a preference. As opposed to, you know, just, you know, sinking into the blueness, oh, how wonderful, and I like it, and I must be a good person. <laughs> and, um, 
you know, it, it, you know, clear a blue sky preference, building itself around the blue sky. It's just the clear recognition. Wow, you know, that's what's going on. Seeing it clearly. And um, so, in a, you know, at times like today, um, there might be for some of us um, dismay, discouragement, fear um, about the amount of hate crimes that are going on in this country and the swirling of hate that's happening that's coming to the surface like a boil has been popped. And uh, it's big, right, for many of us. And so what is it like to step back and see that, all the different things going on inside around that, as opposed to doing the same thing I was doing with the blue sky? You know, oh no, there's all these terrible things happening in the country and no one's doing anything. We have to do something. I'm so terrible or I can't do anything. It's so hard and, you know. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying you're like me, but <laughs> you'll forgive me, but I'm just, you know, trying to make a point. And, um, and so how do we see it in a respectful, clear, full way? It's very important. So to recognize it, confused, dismayed, angry, fearful, whatever it might be, this is what's happening. This is, the mount- this is part of the mountain. People who do spiritual practice sometimes have preferences for which side of the mountain they want to look at. And they might want to look at that part of the mountain that is all beautiful and pastoral and the trees are really nice, it's beautiful pastures with beautiful flowers. But the back side of the mountain that's, you know, filled with gullies and ravines and precipices and, you know, you know, all kinds of, you know, difficult, well, that's not where I want to be. But the idea is if we're going to really clear the fog, the idea is to see it all. Some people prefer the backside and are frightened of the front side where it's all pastoral. <laughs> but you know, the idea is to open to whatever I can see here. So we learn to do this starting to see. The second aspect is tasting. And uh, I, I love this idea of tasting because it's something um, somatic and visceral. It, it's intimate. Seeing can be a little bit removed. And that's kind of the purpose of seeing, this independence, to see it clearly and kind of be, you know, a little bit like the objective observer. But we don't want to remain there. We also want to be intimate and close and feel because you can't really know yourself well unless you feel yourself, unless you have a fuller experience of what's going on. So they say you're tasting it. So if you're afraid or if you're angry, tasting it. What's the taste of it inside? What does it feel like? What's the felt sense of it inside? If you feel delight at the beautiful day in the blue sky, what's the taste of the light? What's the flavor? What's the embodied experience, felt sense of it? Take time to really get to know something. Let it, it's very respectful to give it its time, its due, to really feel it as opposed to, with our thoughts, rushing off to the next thought concern not really stopping and taking time. So this idea of stopping and stopping. So we stop. And a lot of this settling of the clouds comes because we've stopped. If we don't stop, we swirl and we, uh, we're kind of generating more and more clouds and fog. Mm-hmm. So stop. So, so see clearly and then um, taste. And then the third is to open. And so opening is a kind of a choice uh, where we step towards what's happening. We step towards it kind of with the arms going wide, the arms open up and like, oh, okay, let me experience this. So if you feel dismayed or overwhelmed by what's happening in the country, then uh, we, if, if it's not too overwhelming, the idea is once we recognize it and see it, once we get a fuller experience of it, where it is in the body, how it's experienced, what's going on for us, is to step towards it, to feel it more fully, kind of open to feel it more. What's more is there? Let me really be there with it. I mean, what happens if I kind of move towards it with an open chest? Kind of is a, kind of the metaphor. And, uh, and that could be opening up to things that are quite difficult. It could also be opening up to things which are quite wonderful and 
fantastic. So once we really kind of have ta- taken time to feel it and sense it and taste it, then it's possible to open further. In terms of a mountain, maybe it's opening up the caves. Maybe the mountain has lots of caves, dark caves, secret caves, caves with treasure, caves with demons, <laughs> caves with traps, caves with, you know, all kinds of things in your caves. And, uh, and you know, so at some point we have to go into those caves to be the mountain, the full mountain. We can't just be content with the surface of the mountain, and, uh, but to, you know, you know, go into those caves, open up what's there. The, um, if I'm allowed a little bit to kind of change the analogy, <laughs> is, um, you know, the, it's kind of like the tip, or maybe I'll change it, but it's kind of like the tip of the iceberg, right? We don't, it's only a little bit which is above the water, but there's a huge iceberg underwater. There's just a little bit of the mountain that's out of the fog, out of the cloud. And so there's all this stuff that's underneath. And some of it's unknown and a mystery and some, t- some of it probably you've never even knew it was there, or never touched or experienced. And so all these caves, all the, all the stuff that's been relegated to the back room, all the stuff that's never been touched and opened up, the treasures of your inner life, um, the repressed material of your inner life, the unattended, you know, uh, legacy of how the impact life has had on you. So, so stopping, and part of stopping is to allow all this stuff that's in those caves to finally come out, to show themselves. And stopping is so helpful for this because it's best not to be in a hurry. It's best to take your time and let the heart, the body, the inner life find its way. It knows what to do. It knows how to heal. It knows how to open up. It knows how to present you with the treasures. But it can't be on your time frame. It's actually healthier and safer to just stop and make lots of room, lots of time. So much so that I thought the P for stop should be patience. Uh, lots of patience just uh, and meditation is meant to be I think it's good to think of me- meditation to be a very inefficient process <laughs> it's very slow <laughs> takes its time it just happens to be more efficient than all the alternatives <laughs> and uh, so we have to give it the time and so these steps, learning to see properly, to recognize, learning to taste, learning to open, these might take months and years, each one, to really learn to do it well. It's not like, okay, I'm going to, you know, okay, it's five minutes into meditation, okay, I'm going to do, you know, this quickly and just get over with, you know. I have a lot to do today, so I'm going <laughs> to stop, taste, open, and be patient. <laughs> So I can get on with the important things. But anyway, I, I don't think it should be patience, the P. I think the P should be peace. To uh, learn how to be at peace with what's there. And that's more profound than patience, but has the same effect. Uh, to be at peace with it means you don't have to fix it. You don't have a problem with it. Even that which is painful and difficult that we have. Uh, we want to go through it here into it, all the hurts, all the rage, all the fear, all the, you know, the whole shebang that's here, we want to open to it. It's, it's the part of the mountain. We want a whole mountain to be seen. Uh, and uh, not to deny anything or not to condemn anything or not to see anything as being wrong or bad or we're bad because of it, but to go through it and find peace, so finding peace with it, not peace instead of it or without it, which many times people are in a hurry to come to the other side or to avoid. And again, that can also be another kind of bypass. I think for the mountain to be the mountain, for the mountain to really discover how to be stable and present, and the mountain really not to be swayed by the storms of the world, 
all of who we are needs to be present, to be held, to be here. It doesn't mean that all that we, all the impulses we have are acted on. It means that all the impulses are seen and tasted and rather than acting on every impulse we have, opening to it. What, have we, what is it like to open to that impulse? If we have tremendous greed for something, what's it like to open to that impulse? What if we have we want to assert aggression, we're angry and we want to blame or we want to attack someone. To see that, taste that. And what happens if we open it, open, open towards it? What do we see? What's, what's in the caves of anger? What's in the caves of hostility? What do we see deep down inside? And how do we find being at peace with what's here that doesn't condone what's here necessarily and doesn't necessarily condemn what's here. And this relates to the first thing I said. We're not trying to just see what's here. We're trying to see in a new way. We're not trying to pacify what's there. We're trying to, passive, not passively, but peacefully see it, to be peaceful in our relationship to it. And so that takes, you know, that can sometimes can take a second in, you know, in the minor things. or Everything takes a second, sooner or later, but it might take 10 years for that second to, <laughs> to happen. And, um, but you know, it could take a long time. And, um, but to find our peace, what does it take to be at peace with this? And that takes a lot of self-understanding. We have to understand our beliefs that we're operating under. We have to understand our... Um, our, you know, uh, the, imp- the intentions, the motivations in which we base our lives on. We have to understand the ways we react to the experiences of life. We have to really kind of understand ourselves well, the operating principle. You can't just force yourself into being peaceful. There has to be a lot of self-understanding. And so that's why these first steps of stopping, seeing, tasting, opening, is taking our time, taking our time, to really let what's there, the mountain, show itself. And I love the idea of this, the cloud-shrouded mountain, because, you know, it's the sun. As the sun comes out, it burns off the fog or the clouds. So the sun of awareness, the sun of of seeing, tasting, opening, the sun of our our attention is very powerful. And so the, the cloudiness, the the, how things are obscured, how we don't know things, uh, be, uh, fo- drops away. We start seeing more and more clearly. And then at some point we learn how to be at peace with it. Stop. Stop is not the full story. That's not, that's not, what the, you know, that's not the full idea of what all we, all we need to do in, in our practice. Uh, the, um, there's you know, more steps, more understanding of it. Um, there's uh, the importance of a new way of living in the world. There's importance of wisely, you know, the mountain has to get off its butt <laughs> and, uh, you know, and get up and do something. <laughs> it's been sitting there long enough. So there's a lot more than just stopping. So I don't want to leave you with the idea that's all you're supposed to do. But stopping is powerful. It's really significant. Stop. See what's here. Taste what's here. Open to what's here. And find a way to be at peace with what's here. Find a way of being at peace with what's here, knowing that that's a stepping stone to figuring out what should be done, what should be fixed, what should be changed. Because without changing things, that's not good either. But this is, so finding how to be at peace, we're in a much better position to then change ourselves, change what we do, and maybe change the world. So with all the hate that's in this country, I'm pretty confident that uh, if we hate in return, it makes more clouds or, or worse. 
if we bury our head head in the sand, we make it worse. If we swirl around in our fear, we make it worse. But if we can learn to stop with all the different things going on with us around this and learn how in a certain way find our peace with it, in a wise way find our peace with ourselves and everything, then we're in a much better place to try to do something, to change something, to come and respond. Because we need to respond in some way. We need to be people who are able to make a difference. We want to be wonderful change agents to make this world, world a better place and create, you know, create the conditions for less hate to be here. And maybe you can't do some things for people in Florida or Pittsburgh or different places. But um, maybe you can do it for people in Redwood City, the people in your neighborhood. Who knows who you're going to meet? Who knows how they've been treated? Who knows what's, there's a, you know, and that per, that person's a cloud enshrouded mountain as well. How can you help that mountain become clear? That mountain to feel connected and and human contact and support. How can we kind of support the world? So this idea of stopping, letting the clouds settle, so we really hear for ourselves in a full, complete, deep way. It's a, I think it's a very significant act and way of responding to what goes on in the world. It's a stepping stone. So stop. So sit like a mountain. So now I hope that that simile, metaphor, is richer for you. And the next time someone says, you know, sit like a mountain, you'll say yes. <laughs> so um, maybe we can take uh, maybe a couple of, maybe two questions or comments about what I said. Um, anything? Is this on? Yeah. Um, I uh, had experience of that yesterday because I was um, in conversation with with um, someone and feeling myself get angry. <laughs> and I had the impulse to react or attack or get upset. But instead, I realized I was angry. And I just kind of stopped and said, oh, wow. <laughs> There's a lot of there's a lot of anger here, and so that enabled me to just kind of sit with that for a bit and then react differently. I didn't attack; I just put my point of view across. Great. So the so the uh, the mountain wasn't running around frantic. The right. mountains that point got settled, seeing that, and then that was a wiser way of being. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I had a question about that patience. It really resonated with me because I want to answer as quickly. (laughs) Uh, And I'm curious how you would uh, advise handling situations in which you need to make a time-sensitive decision. Like there is um, time bound to it. Uh, Yeah, I'm like, do I just sit meditation for three days before that (laughs) point? (laughs) Well, I've known people who've done that. They had to make a hugely important decision for the life, like it was you know major life decision, and but, but they, you know they had a couple of weeks or something, and so they went on a meditation retreat for a week. And um, and usually my advice there, when people come with something like that, is the best they can to shelve the issue for the first six days of the seven day retreat, uh, uh, if they can. And I usually try to give them a little carrot for why that's good. I say you'll be in such a better space to answer that question. Uh, once you've kind of settled yourself in a deep way, you'll have different eyes, different understanding, different connection to your heart. So if you can put, a, put aside the, you know, the rumination about it all for, and let's see what happens at the end of the retreat. And some people, that brings a lot of clarity. They, different sense of values become up. Their, their deeper values or deeper, what's most important for them stands out more clearly and then it can be easier to make a decision. So some people can do that. Um, and... Um, 
So what to do when you have, you know, an hour, you know, or, you know, it's really short. Um, I do, I do put a lot of value in uh, being quiet. Um, But not only that, I know the biggest decision I made in my life, just maybe three, four decisions I can think of, um, I actually, uh, part of what allowed me to do the, make the dis- come to a decision was uh, my churning, my thinking about it. So I have some respect for the value of thinking and churning and, and just kind of being with it. And I like going for walks and then the walk thinking and thinking and being with it. Thoughts are, at least for me, are an important part of the process. But what I've learned is not to expect the answer to come from my thoughts. Mm-hmm. And I used to burden myself and burden my thoughts with the, like, I'm going to find the answer. You know, that, what the, and, um, but I had to do, that was kind of like the thinking was part of the cooking. And the walking, but for me, walking, uh, for some people, meditation does, it, meditation does this. The walking is a way to let all the emotions that are connected to it, uh, to give them some freedom to kind of move through me. And the energies of the body can move. And so the combination of thinking and being my body and having the things all move, I find a wonderful combination. And then what happened to me, the big decisions I had, I don't think they were, were they time sensitive? Maybe a little bit. And um, was, um, then the answers came uh, when I was quiet and maybe at least expecting it. It was kind of like then they could, something could pop up, something could, something could, could unfold. So that might not help you if you, you, don't, you know, if you don't have enough time for even going for a walk. I'm just trying to offer you some ideas. Great, thank you. Okay, so thank you for those two comments or questions. And um, so this idea of the mountain. So the, idea, the metaphor is a metaphor for you. That uh, you, when you're whole, you when you're full, complete, like all of, you know, really there. In a way you feel maybe stable or maybe maybe at peace or maybe just a feeling of like really here connected and alive and present like yes and I suspect that all of you have had some hint of being that way some hint some time in your life where you felt somehow like all of you was here just felt complete or felt full or nothing was left out and just you know that moment and maybe a hint of that and uh, it felt good and maybe it was a mixed bag. Maybe some of it was quite difficult. But it, being full with it was what was satisfying. So it's the satisfying feeling of being the mountain, the whole mountain with the fog gone away. So if you're willing, um, I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to uh, turn to maybe two people next to you, little groups of three, and you can say hello to each other and introduce yourself and welcome each other to IMC today. Even if it's your first time, it's, you can still welcome people. And, uh, and if it feels okay with you, it feels nice, uh, maybe share with very simple, very simple, just a few words perhaps, of um, uh, what was satisfying for you in whatever hints you had of what it's like to be full be a complete mountain is there. And uh, what was satisfying about that? And, and, um, and then if you keep talking, that's nice. And, but, you know, and then uh, the path potluck will be set up and, and you can come up the, down the mountain to eat. 